hey, the Lord be with you. Also with you. And I don't think I've ever used that. Um, there you go. And I don't, I don't love it. So <laughs> I don't know if I'll do it again. Uh, but let us pray. Uh, Almighty God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that it is cooler. Um, Lord, thank you that we're here. Um, be with us as you always are. Lord, let us remember your grace and your mercy, your love for us. Let us remember who you are. Sin and through your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as promised, today we're doing a fun thing. We're going, uh, who was it? Brian, I think, was like, I think I'm ready for the fire and brimstone. Oh, is everybody ready? It's going to be fun. Uh, I'll be so uplifting. Oh, man. So here is what I am going to ask of y'all. Uh, I am going to do, yes. Before you do that, you have to have a pop quiz and yes. ask somebody <laughs> what, what we learned last week. Wow. You know what, good uh, point. I've been ranting about it all week. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. Hey Bennett, what did we learn last week? <laughs> Yeah, he's the kind of kid that's like, we forgot our whole year. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody boo oh. Bennett, boo. <laughs> 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 All right, Bennett, what did we learn last week? Uh, last week, this is what I learned. All right. That the uh, atonement uh, was the continuation of the Exodus mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. and that the death, Jesus' death on the cross, was ransom mm -hmm. for our sin. Yes. The people at that time, all the way until today. Yes. But if it was just the death on the cross, yeah. that would have been just a good story. Yep. It was the resurrection mm. that brought it, brought it all to fulfillment. Yes. 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 Now, who yes. makes yes. 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 So, okay, question, continuation off that. Who was the ransom paid to? God. Mm, was it paid to God? The devil. Yeah. The devil. The devil. The um, devil. <laughs> Yes, it was paid to the devil or powers of evil. You're welcome to envision and visage the devil as you wish, okay? Not little guy or big guy with very red, fiery, you know, horns and stuff. The devil is the prince of the power of the air, right? This is the, the ruler of the world, right? This is what we were talking about. Jesus is the lord of the world and we were ransomed from the ruler of the world, the one who is now at work, Ephesians 2, and the sons of disobedience, right? This is who we were indebted to, enslaved to, and Jesus liberated us from that with his death, right? That is Christus Victor. That is the kind of ransom theory or the Christus Victor that is our subjective. No, that's our classic. That's our classic atonement paradigm that we've talked about. I don't know where my whiteboard is, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> But today, it is right there, but it is blank. So I think that someone was so lovely and cleaned it off for me, and that was so nice. Um, but I, uh, I was just really kind of them. Uh, but today, we are talking about the objective theory, right? The objective paradigm. We are talking about, it's, it's similar to ransom insofar as Jesus' death paid something. It paid a ransom. But instead of a um, death debt paid to the powers of this world, powers of evil, the devil, the devil, um, it is a ransom paid to God, right? And so we're going to talk through that. We're going to talk about problems with it. We're gonna, I'm going to give you, um, I want us to, the thing that I'm going to ask of us is that we give it as much credence as we can. A lot of us are coming in pretty predisposed to be against this theory, and for good reason. I'm going to go ahead and affirm that. For good reason. In its most egregious form, absolutely this is a bad thing. But I want us to talk through, in some ways, how this actually does show up, and we can't ignore it. So, atonement. We are going to talk through the history of substitution. Why do people hate it? Should we hate it? and maybe a new vision of substitution, right? Does that sound good to everybody? So we're gonna go through a history, that's probably our longest one, and then why do people hate it, should we hate it? So, starting off, a history of substitution. We 
come to substitution by way of St. Anselm of Canterbury. Sam, am I still in frame if I'm over here? Okie dokie. Um, and St. Anselm of Canterbury, 1100s-ish. He wrote a book called Cur Deus Homo, Why Did God Become Human? Why God Became Human. And he kind of grounds a lot of his stuff in Tertullian, who is a second century, third century Addison? Second, second century church father. Everyone, my friend Addison from seminary is here. He's the best. He knows more about this stuff than I do. Yeah, give him a round of applause. Come on. Yeah. That's right. So Tertullian, he grounds a lot of what he thinks in Tertullian, but he ropes in kind of a Roman uh, idea of feudalism. So he's coming in in the middle of um, the Middle Ages, St. Anselm of Canterbury, and he is writing a, he's writing about this feudal system where people would own people and it's all honor-based, right? So, Curdeus Homo, why God became human. And so he has six points in that argument that he grounds in uh, the incarnation and reason, right? And so here is St. Anselm of Canterbury's idea of substitution, which again, will bring us forth to the present day with penal substitutionary atonement. One, the essence of sin is humanity's failure to render to God what is rightfully due to God, and sin dishonors God, right? That is not news. That's something that is like, maybe you've never heard it put this way, but that is one of those things like, in the Bible, yes, the essence of sin is humanity's failure to render to God what is rightfully due God, whether that is our actions, whether, whether that is our worship or lack thereof, etc., etc. It is humanity's responsibility to restore to God what they, we, have robbed God of, as well as to make reparations above and beyond for injuring and offending God. God's honor inherently demands such restoration and oppression. So it's not our uh, reparation. So it's not simply that we've sinned. It's that we have dishonored God. So to come back to the point of not sinning, we have still dishonored God. So there is decidedly not sinning, then there's decidedly honoring God. And we have done neither of those. So because of sin, we have already missed the point of honoring God, and we're already not. So that is confusing and a little bit not in our time. But if we think about it like if we are like perfect state, we are not sinning, we are honoring God. Correct? Both of those things. One leads to another, but they are two things. But in the state, in the fallen state that we are in, we are both sinning and dishonoring God. If we were to simply not sin, we would have already dishonored God. Does that make sense? Yes. And so restoration and reparation needs to be made. That's the honoring God. Third point. Humanity can never restore such a debt. Even if humans did their best and did not sin further, they would only be rendering what God has already due. So in St. Anselm of Canterbury's uh, thought process, God is the highest being of which no other can be uh, thought of, rendered. There, God is the highest being, and because of that, God deserves the most honor. So even if we did not sin, we would only be like offering to God what God has already due. The necessary reparation above and beyond, that's an important phrase, would always be left undone. Beyond this, humanity does live in a state of bondage to the devil. So remember, we've already seen this before. So this substitution already goes into some of the stuff we've seen before where we're in bondage to the devil. Next points. God is left with two basic options at this point. Because we are in sin, we are dishonoring God, God is do honor, and we cannot sin and honor God, God is left with two basic options. To punish humanity as we rightfully deserve in this framework, yes? Or to accept satisfaction made on their behalf. But now the predicament. Satisfaction can only be made by a human since it is humanity that owes God that debt. Yet no mere human has the resources to make satisfaction for the entire human race. So because humans are the one who have dishonored God with their sin, a human, humans, have to make atonement. But humans can't make atonement because we're unable to. So what do we get to? The incarnation. The sole solution is to be found in the mystery of the God-man, Jesus Christ. 
as God. So we have to have a very high understanding of the incarnation. That in, in, in no way is Jesus just pretending to be human. In no way did Jesus become God as a human. We have to understand that Jesus is both completely human, completely divine. And so in this way, can the God-man Jesus Christ, the incarnate God himself, make restoration and reparation on behalf of the entire human race? That's why Jesus became man. That's why God became man in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus died. In St. Anselm of Canterbury's understanding, this is the entire reason. Yes? So, point six, point five, though. So, humans can't uh, satisfy it yes. because we have sinned. Mm -hmm. There has to be a sinless person. It's like yes. an unblemished. It's the unblemished, yes. Yeah. So, because humans have sinned, there's no going back. So, we have to have a perfect person who does not exist outside of the God man, Jesus Christ, the incarnate God himself. In St. Anselm's framework, this is why God became human. This is why Jesus died. Does this all follow if you accept every one of these points? Yeah. I understand I'm asking for a lot here. Yes? <laughs> Okie dokie. Thank you, everybody. So, yeah. yes. Look at and then six. David. God is sacrificing himself to God to pay. Yes, we will get to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You're right. So one of this thing, one of the issues that comes up here is that this seems to be a divided Godhead. No? Right. That like God is somehow sacrificing himself to God. The other way to look at that is that God, him, God puts himself on the line for this. Right? There is a way to see this where it is not God demanding. It's not a, it's not a blood lust, vengeful, retributive God who needs this. It's the way that things work. Because, right, he's grounding this in reason and natural law. So if God exists, God is the highest thing that could exist. And as such, God deserves the most honor. So this is, we are talking about just kind of natural law in the Middle Ages. And I'm not, you will not hear me downplay anything in the Middle Ages, because that is not something I'm going to do, because these are real people who lived real lives. And they were working with the best they had. But... If you are living in an honor-based culture, an honor-shame-based culture, of course this is what you're gonna come up with. Of course, if God himself exists at all, God is the highest being and therefore deserving of the most honor. And so when honor is besmirched, that has to be satisfied. That has to be made right. So it's not that God is demanding this, it's just what is. It's just the rules, man. We don't make them. That's just what happens. Okay? And so this, this view is that God is putting himself on the line. This isn't God saying, this is not necessarily God having a gun pointed at the world that God has to fire. This is God putting himself on the line to satisfy the honor that is rightly due his name. Yes? Are we following that so far? JB, you had a question. In the first slide, you said, you used the word rob. I rob. Think. Okay. Yes. Yes. So with sin itself, we dishonor God. We rob God of the honor that's due His name. Yes, Sam. So He fulfills His own honor. Yes. He's the and He's the only one that could. I know. Yes. <laughs> Remember, I know. I get it. But I'm just saying, when we're in the medieval framework, we are working with what we've got. Yes, Leanne. So there's a lot of accounting. Um, so that's, we're going to talk about sin some, good Lord, I should have spaced this out. Um, so, cause folks, I have 33 slides. Anyway, um, uh, we have, <laughs> so what constitutes a black entry and a red entry? Um, something that dishonors God is sin. We're talking 10 commandments. We're talking anything that goes against what Paul talked about. We're talking anything that Jesus, so that is against, right? right but, but like in a lot of the honor based denominations, yeah. Um, yeah. They came up with things that weren't based on the pillars or the commandments. Absolutely. Like, huh. Yeah, so in the medieval age, there were, like, they were working off of stuff like Shepherd of Hermas. They're working off of, um, what's the one? The Didache. These things that were from first and second centuries that were like uh, the rule of St. Benedict. This kind of stuff that came around that was like, all right, here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. If we do it right, we're doing it right. If we do it wrong, we are out. That's a red, not a black, right? And so anything that adds to it 
is something that we're doing well. Anything that takes away from it, takes away from it. So that is, I hope that answers your question. Um, so, but understanding this is the whole point. One, we're working in a medieval frame set or framework mindset. That's something we've got to understand from the jump. We're in an honor shame based system. Whether we're still there is totally up for debate. <laughs> but secondly, God is not here with a gun pointed at the world. God is due honor as by very virtue of being God. And so by our sin, we dishonor God. And so the only way to get that honor back is for God to get on the line himself. And he does in the person of Jesus Christ. So, um, so two prongs, the incarnation of the God man, Jesus Christ. It's very important. Reason, necessity of God and God's honor, right? So we get those. Next, um, the Reformation, the feudal system led to the Teutonic political theory and the notion of the law as something. So it wasn't necessarily honor anymore. It wasn't like you can do whatever you want, but as long as the, the Lord is being honored, now it was here is a law that we are all ascribing to, and we are all under. The legal theory came to prominence as a righteous, as a righteous judge, God cannot allow his law to be broken without punishment. Christ's sacrifice satisfies God's requirement of justice. It thus propitiates or um, satisfies God's wrath towards sinners and is the basis on which divine forgiveness can righteously extend to them. This is where there is a clear through line from St. Anselm of Canterbury, honor shame, to the legal theory, to penal substitutionary atonement, where we're going to get in just a second. Right? Yes? Was the, the title of that reference? Yes, so this is right around the, so this is 1500, 1600. We're looking at Reformation times. So we've gone from the Middle Ages to the Reformation kind of enlightenment stuff, right? And so with the kind of advent of the law itself and that political theory kind of coming forth, we're seeing that make its way into theology. So God is a righteous judge who cannot stand when the law is broken, right? And so we talk about the law some in, in the scriptures, that's a whole other conversation. That is not the same as the law that we're seeing in like legal code today, right? So, but this is, this now sees not God as a feudal Lord whose honor has been dispersed, but God is a righteous judge who cannot stand the presence of uh, a, the breaking of the law. Yes? We're there? Okay. So, in this, so yes. In this theory real quick. Um, Jesus' death covers all the sin that's occurred up till then. Yes, and is, is beyond. It, is, and beyond? And beyond, yeah. So the book of Hebrews says, like, in, in earlier days, I think, do we have this in the, no, not this morning. But in the book of Hebrews, there's uh, a point where it says, the blood of bulls and goats covered sins then, but now we have a sacrifice in the God-man Jesus Christ once and for all. So it covers everything that happened, everything that was happening, everything that will happen. That covers this. That propitiates God's wrath. And so the word wrath is where we're going to get in a lot of trouble. And so I'm, go I'm quoting someone here, but I will st I will try not to use that word a whole lot. Yes, David. Is it uh, the same sort of theory which just evolved in the feudal times from honor-based to sort of law-based? Yes. Right? So there's a, there is a direct through line right, right to the Reformation. Right. Cool. right. And so... Um, this is just saying God's wrath is just the God. This is God's righteous response to the breaking of the law. So this is you steal something, you have to go to jail. You do something wrong, you have to spend time making it right. But because of the way that sin works, there is no way that we can spend time making something right in the eyes of a righteous judge. Whether I agree with this is not or not is not on the table. Now, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about here. In the Reformation period, this was the thought when it comes to substitution. There were lots of people who believed already in moral exemplar theory and Christus Victor, but that's not necessarily what's here. So we have that. In the modern age, penal substitutionary atonement, folks, PSA. This is what we think about when we think about, let's say, a Baptist or a fundamentalist, because uh, not all Baptists are fundamentalists, but a fundamentalist kind of view of this, right? There's nothing that we can do to make it right, so Jesus made it right. Everything that we do is actually a filthy rag before the throne of God, etc., etc., etc. 
this has taken the face of the objective paradigm and the Romans Road. How many of you guys are familiar with the Romans Road or have heard it before? Oh, my former evangelicals, put them up, baby! There it is. So this is the Romans Road. If you grew up evangelical or spent any measure of time in the church, uh, of the evangelical church, you are utterly familiar with this, right? And so the Romans Road has four or five steps depending on who you ask. This is the Romans Road. One, the problem of humanity. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one who is righteous, not even one, right? So we have sin, everyone's sin, no one is righteous. And what are the wages of sin? Death. Death, exactly right. But, praise God, the hope of humanity, right? But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We'll talk about that word for in a little bit. That's the hope of humanity. Secondly, human beings who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood. Very important. Whom God put forth as a sacrifice, right? Effective through faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, righteous judge, right? We talked about that. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. That answers your question, right? Because we talked about that, that covered everything that happened before, everything that happened after. This is Romans Road, hope of humanity. Now, the response of a grateful humanity, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we have two facts, right? We have everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. The wages of sin is death. But God did this amazing thing. The response of humanity, call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Four, the result. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this great... Things are good now. That's the result of this. So that's how, that is kind of the current face, and there are lots of other ones. There's Way of the Master, there's tons of other stuff. But Romans Road is truly a great distillation of what um, penal substitutionary atonement looks like in the modern age. Other ways that it shows up, this is fun, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and the Hunger Games. People substitute themselves <laughs> constantly in a good story. Yes, and it makes us cry and gives us goosebumps every time. Yes. <laughs> Oh, Narnia as well. Oh man, I'm an Anglican and everything. Uh, <laughs> yes. Did you do something I've been thinking? I think about the wages of sin is death in the Roman road, road way too much. <laughs> uh, and it just occurred to me as an adult the other day that those are not like canonically in order or described anywhere outside of like a Wanda's at First Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as a singular thing. Yeah. As like one anyway. Yeah. No, you're right. So if anybody needs to untie that, I just untied it. <laughs> it don't exist within the canon of anything. Yeah, so this is... I, I, we could have done an entire six-week series on this. I'm now realizing. That's good to know. Um, but in the modern day, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, these are places where substitution, where a righteous person or an innocent person takes up for someone who is on the line. No? Like every time, this is, and that gives us goosebumps, that makes us cry. It's what good stories are made of. It's just someone laying down their life for someone else. Leanne? How does this feed into indulgences? I know we, we skipped. Good the God, way. I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> you and I, three slots. You and I can talk. We will talk. Good Lord. Wow. That is, that's all, that's maybe two other classes. Um, so, <laughs> no. Incredible question. <laughs> Incredible question. So why do people hate substitution? And there will be a time for you to tell me why you hate substitution. History. For the most part, opponents of substitution rightly point out that the early church fathers did not write about it at all. That is correct. Yeah, and Addison says, so what's, so this can be over now. Um, like we got nothing else to say. The early church fathers did not write about it at all. We talked about last week, um, that the early church fathers wrote almost exclusively about Christus Victor and ransom theory, right? They didn't, they hardly touched this at all. When I say that this is in Tertullian, there are truly whispers of it in Tertullian. Like that is whispers about it. That is one reason people don't like it. Opponents also in the contemporary frame, uh, there is resistance to the idea of sin and judgment at all. We don't like it, it's uncomfortable, I agree. It is uncomfortable. I also think it's necessary. That's another thing. Sin forms no part of many of the contemporary accounts of the crucifixion 
Instead, we hear an exchange like this, why did Jesus die? To show us how much God loves us. Now, um, Tony did a great job, and I actually think he's very right, but in the contemporary frame, with liberation theology and a lot of other ones, there was more of an idea that Jesus died, not necessarily to atone for sin, but because of sin. Sin is what put God on the cross. Not necessarily that Jesus went to the cross and was like, put it on me, put it on me, I'll take it. It was the fact that our sin was able to do the unthinkable and kill God, right? And so that's why the work of liberation theology is to pull the, the innocent off of the crosses, no? So sin has very little, and we're gonna, defining sin is a very tough thing <laughs> at this stage. And so um, I think that there is a ton of sin in, there's a ton to talk about in sin with liberation theology and uh, Christus Victor, but substitutionary atonement theory has a, it's basically all sin. No, that's, I've said that word maybe more than any this entire presentation. Uh, why do people hate it? There is much resistance to the idea of substitution and its most prominent ideation, penal substitutionary atonement, as it casts God as? Child abuser. Child abuser. <laughs> Give me some more. What else, how else does this envision God? Wrathful. Wrathful, vengeful, retributive, mean, masochistic. Vindictive. Yes, all of these things. Yes, this is why people dislike it, right? Because it forces us to think of God in this form, in its most prominent form, as someone who would do an evil act in the name of good. And that takes God and turns God from the God who's deserving of all honor. To imperfect. To imperfect. To imperfect and looks way more like the devil than he should, right? So, other things. It's crude. It keeps bad company. Culturally conditioned. Views death is divorced from the resurrection. It's incoherent. An, in, an innocent person cannot take on the guilt of another glorifies suffering and encourages masochistic behavior. It's too theoretical, it's too, too scholastic and abstract. It depicts a vindictive God. It is essentially violent, it is morally objectionable. It does not develop Christian character. It is too individualistic, I did that twice. It is controlled by an emphasis on punishment. That's all from Fleming Rutledge's The Crucifixion. Beautiful book, yes. We also can't all agree on what an adequate substitution would be for crimes. Sure, yeah. And to say that like somehow you lying to your mom is enough to put God on the cross is like, is that really? really? No mom, that dress doesn't make me Yeah, <laughs> right. yes. Doesn't it sort of fly in the face with some of the, all right, so the Ten Commandment language is like at the time it was sort of like, you don't have to engage in this kind of activity anymore. Like we have, sort of like we don't have to sacrifice our children to the gods anymore. Yeah. So, I don't know, I just made, so that, that kind of flies in the face of all that. Like God's A little. literally God sacrificed yeah. the kids. And, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. So I think, should we hate substitution? You shouldn't hate. <laughs> no. Um, short answer is no. So none of any of the atonement theories would work without substitution, right? The ransom that was paid to the devil, to the powers of this world, was paid on our behalf. That we were substituted in and out, right? If we talk about pulling the innocent off of the cross and we talk about liberation theory, it was God dying a death, the worst death, so that we don't have to, to put on trial and to put to open shame the people and the powers that we put in there. That was so we didn't have to. This is, there is every good reason to hate and take issue with penal substitutionary atonement and substitutionary atonement generally in its most egregious form, PSA. That there is no reason at all to rail against the motif of substitution with the same sort of unsubtle and unserious formulaic zeal as its contemporary supporters often do in its defense. So substitution is real. That happened and we can't get away from it if we're gonna talk about what happened in the Bible. That is all over, and we'll talk about this right here, I think. Yeah, the theme of substitution does properly arise out of the biblical narrative, where it appears in various contexts as part of an organic whole. It appears as a theme wherever the Greek words huper and peri are used to declare the meaning of Christ's death. So huper means for, peri means on account of. And so we see it here. 
Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for us, one for whom Christ died. He has died for all. Christ Jesus, who himself, who gave himself for me. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ having become a curse for us. This is all over. Christ did die. Christ was substituted for us. That's just a non-negotiable. Now, who that, why that has, had to happen is where we come into the other parts that we've talked about in the previous week. So substitution is a non-negotiable. But the underlying motif, it's best understood as such as a supporting other themes. Christus Victor, moral exemplar, liberation. <coughs> substitution had to have happened. But it doesn't have to look like penal substitutionary atonement. That, that is correct to like rail against in its most egregious form. I agree with that. Um, incarnation, it cannot be divorced. We are running out of time. Oh, man. Um, it cannot be divorced from the incarnation. We talked about that last week, right? It cannot be divorced from the whole. Uh, sin, like it or not, the teaching of substitution uh, does square more readily with God's judgment of sin in the Bible. Uh, the theme motif of substitution does not have to present a view of God that is vindictive and retributive and wrathful and vengeful, but a God who is holy and beyond human comprehension and understanding, a God of power and might, one who would himself go to unimaginable length to unite us to himself. That's what good substitution looks like. And it does not have to look like penal substitution. Yes, Addison. Um, wonderful job, Gavin. Oh, thanks. Ha <laughs> ha. Right. Right. Um, I'm a history person, so I like to put things in the frame of history. Yeah. And so the reason that these are whispers in the early church is yeah. because they had not become the church of the empire. Yeah. So they could. It's the. It follows that same line of why it took so long for a revelation to become canonical. Mm. Because they couldn't square the liberty of Jesus yeah. with this punishment and atonement yeah. theory. Yes. And I think that's like an important and then when we get yeah. to that is a huge when piece. When we get to the Reformation and we get to the legalistic understanding of it, yeah. the church is fully in control. Yes. And they now can see Jesus in this way. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to just play around with how yeah. you see it and understand that there's some consensus. And yeah, then so that keeps going, I think, to the indulgences. Yeah. Like yes, it does. It yes, it does. Yes, so this is why when we come to the Teutonic political theory thing, we start seeing the legal system become a huge part of our theology. Instead of, which is why when the third century came around, that's when the church fathers were no longer the desert fathers. They were not writing and being killed for writing. When they became the Church of the Empire, that's when we started to see more substitution stuff kind of come up. And so when the Middle Ages hits and we see the Roman feudal system kind of become a thing, it is a fully fleshed out thing. And now Christianity is a part of it. Yes, Leanne? Well, if you look at it from a psychological perspective, it wouldn't be present in the early post-crucifixion uh, post church because there would be a huge PTSD moment. Yes. And you're not going to process that and you're not going to deal with it until you've had time away from it. Yes. So that's part of the issue. Yes. Probably. So what we see here, very good point. What we see here is a history of human beings being human beings, right? Time and again and time and again and time and again and doing their best to work with the things that they had to make sense of what they were given, which was the death of Jesus Christ. And so now where we are, where we're, we're again working with the things we have, when Tony was teaching about liberation theology, that's been around since the 1940s at the earliest. And it is still a very legitimate and valid and good atonement theory that we need to talk about. And so we are now currently doing the same thing that St. Anselm of Canterbury was doing. We're working with what we have to make sense of what we were given, right? And so this is how we need to understand substitution as something in the line of what we're being given that we're being made, that's being made sense of. Does this all make sense? Very helpful. Whew, we did it. So this um, is how we got flagellant monks. What'd you say? So this is how we got flagellant monks though. Uh, in, a, in a way, uh, yes. So again, a new vision of substitution. We've kind of talked through this. Penal substitution versus theme slash motif that is a part of things, yes. I will talk about this next week because this would be a full 10 minutes and we don't have it. Um, Rene Girard and the scapegoat theory and mimetic desire and this violence cannot stand the presence of one who owes it nothing. Think about that for a week and we'll get back to it. All right, everybody, let's get out of here.